have been praising God for his glory in creation, singing the song, How Great Thou Art, and hearing the hymns. I wonder, that's, when, you, when you hear the words, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, I see the, gentle, the brook and feel the gentle breeze, how do you reconcile that when it's zero degrees or ten below? Can you praise God for his glory when you walk outside and your nose hairs freeze? Can we, can we give God glory and praise for those days as well? I think we can. We're in a series on the Psalms, and the word for the Psalms is the Hillel. It literally means the praises. But we have been, we're going to discover and see that the Psalms contain much, much more than just hymns of praise. Although this morning we're really focused on exaltation and praising God. This series is meant to teach us a couple of things. One, how do we express our hearts to God? What is the vocabulary of faith? How do we learn to speak to God what we feel and what we, what's actually inside of us? Maybe from King Lear and Shakespeare's poem, uh, Shakespeare's play, we should speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Sometimes I think in church we, we think about what we ought to say. We don't want to offend God. Newsflash for you. He already knows what you think, what's really going on inside. And it's actually probably more offensive to him when we cover that up and dress it up with churchy language. We spiritualize it. We should be honest with God, and that's really at the heart of this series, Songs of the Soul, learning to express what's really inside of us. But the other part of the Psalms, they not only teach us how to speak to God, they teach us how God speaks to us. They instruct us. They teach us who he is and who we are in relation to him. And nowhere is that more true than in this psalm we're going to look at this morning, Psalm 8. This psalm teaches us who God is and who we are in relation to him. I'm going to read you can follow along with me. I finally remembered to bring my reading glasses so I'm not making it up as I go along. Psalm 8. We'll read the whole psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers... The moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Most of you will know, uh, or maybe have heard, or not be surprised at least to hear, that King David, the shepherd boy turned warrior king, wrote this psalm. And if you know anything about David's story, David, before he became Israel's greatest king and the warrior who slew Goliath, he was basically the youngest of eight brothers keeping track of his father's flocks. He spent a lot of time outside, stargazing, watching over the sheep, laying out under the stars. We don't know when he wrote this psalm, if it was later in his life or if he penned it as a, as a young man and had it in his mind and heart and then it was collected later. I like to think that he at least composed it in his mind and heart lying out under the stars as a young man, looking up at the heavens, pondering the meaning of his existence, his own life, and of human life in general. The whole psalm centers around uh, this, this one central question. But it's sandwiched in these two exaltations, these expressions of praise to God. Even though it teaches us to exclaim God's glory in creation, which we'll get to in a minute, the psalm is really about this question David poses. Did you hear it? In verses 3 and 4. And in, in fact, verse 3 is the context for the question of verse 4. Verse 3, he says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place. So here's David, gazing up. When I see all that you've made, who am I? What am I? What are we that you would care, that you would know or take notice of us? I think this is a question that's common to human life. You've all asked it. If not out loud, you've thought it, your own version of it. I have, haven't you? Maybe not looking at the night sky, although I'm guessing you probably have had that experience. We've all come to the place of asking the question, is this it? Who am I? What am I? Why are we here? Is this all that life is? It's the question of existence. 
That's what this psalm is really about. How do we understand and make sense of this life we're living? The fact that we're, we exist at all. Years ago when I was a high school pastor here, when I'd first come, I, I've been here over 20 years now, but when I first came, I was a high school pastor. We took our first trip to Ecuador, which we still go to, and many of you have been there and, or prayed about it and heard about the stories happening in Ecuador. It's an amazing ministry. Uh, El Refugio is this r- uh, remarkable Christian camp that we've helped to pay for, build, and uh, serve in over a decade, more than two decades. The first time we ever went there, they did not yet own the property to build this camp. So Rick Borman took me and 20 students and a couple of leaders to the property. We camped. We had permission to camp there. There were no buildings to sleep in yet. We camped at what's called high camp, about 10,000 feet in elevation in the Andes Mountains. A bunch of high school students, and we laid out under the stars, looking at the southern hemisphere. Everything was kind of backwards. And Rick pointed out to us the southern cross. This is an image you'll see on the screen here. It's not of that night, but the southern cross is laying low on the horizon there. Can you see it? And this is not... I didn't take this picture. <laughs> this is uh, got off of Google. Thank you, Google. However, I remember laying there in the Andes Mountains, gazing up at the stars with our students, and Rick Borman ta- pointing out the constellations and talking to us about God's creation, and somebody read Psalm 8. The, the next night, we gathered around the fire. We're talking about our experiences, and a couple of students were reflecting on their, that night, stargazing. Many of the students were talking about how their hearts were filled with worship and wonder looking up at the heavens. But you know a couple of them? said they felt kind of lost. They felt rather insignificant. They felt lonely looking up at the heavens. I think those two extremes express the range of what we feel. You probably felt both at one time or another in your life. Awe and wonder and worship at the God who made it all and who loves you. And also, do I even matter? Does anybody care? Is anyone out there? How should we respond I think the two great lies we hear in our culture to this question of existence are, one, A, you're God. Or at least you can be your own God. You make the rules. And number two, I said A, didn't I? That would be a B. One, A, B, you know, it gives you an idea. Number two, you're an accident. These are the two extremes that our culture tells us. One is, you are God, or you can be your own God. The other is, you don't matter. You're insignificant. You're the product of accidental forces. To quote the philosopher Bertrand Russell, man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. Think about that for a minute. You are the product of forces that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. Your origin, his origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs are but the outcome of the accidental collocation of atoms. No fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. A cheery thought. And the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Whoa. Now, maybe not put so starkly, but that's an honest representation of what's being spoon-fed to many of us in our culture. You're not here by any intention. Your life is the accidental collocation of atoms. You might feel significant. You might feel important. But those feelings are just chemistry in your brain. They cannot be counted on. They actually don't mean anything. And the best thing you could do is to face that stark reality and get on with your life. That's what he's saying. Which is it? When I consider your heavens, when I look up at the moon and the stars which you've set in place, the work of your fingers... Am I, is it meaningless? Or is it meaningful? Or to maybe make a, a, to quote somebody, Steven Pinker, Harvard professor of evolutionary psychology, a more recent scholar, wrote a book called The Stupidity of Dignity. Here's his argument. If you face the evolutionary biology and psychology facts, according to Pinker and others like him, you have to face the reality that all our talk about human dignity and human rights is really baseless. 
It's stupid, the stupidity of dignity. There is no ground for human rights and human dignity. This is, an, this is an evolutionary psychologist saying this. Like, wake up, people. All the debate about the dignity of human life is meaningless. You need to face it. Russell believed, and others believe like him, that we should build our lives on the foundation of unyielding despair. Psalm 8 has a different perspective, a different foundation on which to build your life. Because if it's true, I mean, if it's true that the powers behind the universe don't know you or care, then your feelings of significance or your longing for transcendence are meaningless. Notice how David puts it in verse 3, though. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers. Did you notice that? When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers. Now, in, in, you'll read through the Psalms and you'll see different references to God's hand and God's arm. When you see references to God's hand, that's a Hebrewism a way of talking about God's sovereign control. He holds us in the palm of his hand. He holds all things in his hand. His arm is his strength to save. The salvation of my God's right arm will save. He's mighty to say by the strength of his arm. David does not say the work of your hand, sovereign control, the work of your arm, power to save. He says the work of your what? Fingers. Do this for a minute. Touch your fingertips, right? Anybody make models when you were a kid? I did. I got a lot of glue on my mom's table. I wasn't allowed to use the table anymore. But the intricacy. Or think of an artist. The attention to detail. A craftsman. That's the imagery. Now, ancient Near Eastern cosmologies at the time of, of, of the, the, the time of the Genesis was, was being written and the ancient Near Eastern pagan nations around Israelites, they had their legends and myths about how the world came into existence. Do you know that all of the ancient Near Eastern cosmologies have creation myths and almost all of them tell of the world coming into being through violence and bloodshed and pain and struggle. A great battle between forces. Only the Christian story, the Bible, depicts one solitary God, the only God, creating out of the love that he, that he is with the work of his fingers, intricate attention to detail. It's, the world didn't come into existence out of a great bloody battle in the cosmos, but by the work of an artist who loves what he made. It's a totally different view. This is David saying, when I look up at the heavens, I see the care and attention of an artist. Let me give you an illustration. If our galaxy, the Milky Way, was the size of North America, <clears throat> the North American continent, so you could reduce the Milky Way to North America, do you know how big our solar system would be by comparison? Are you with me? Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is the size of North America. Then our solar system would be the size of that, uh, roughly, the styrofoam coffee cup you had a moment ago out there in the lobby. That's our solar system if our galaxy is, the, is North America. And do you know how big Earth would be? A barely visible speck of a coffee ground on the bottom of that coffee cup. And we know that our galaxy is only one of a hundred billion galaxies that we can detect we can see. And God made that with his fingers. Think about it for a minute. He made it with his fingers. No wonder the psalm begins and ends with, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. David says your name, personal God, creating in love, attention to detail, in all the earth. The, I think the central point here is this. When David asks the question, what is man? What is humanity? The answer is this. You cannot understand the meaning of humanity apart from the majesty of God. You cannot make sense of human life ultimately apart from the majesty and glory of God. What David is saying is, and we're trying to do this in our culture, aren't we? We're trying to talk about human rights and human dignity and human value and, and people's desires and what makes them unique and special. But we've disconnected ourselves from the context in which we can even answer that question. You cannot answer that question apart from the one who made you. You cannot answer the question, what is man, unless you first answer the question, who is God? 
It's only in light of his majesty that our life even has meaning and begins to make sense. And this is why the psalm brings us to this declaration of praise. A question of existence and a declaration of praise. It's no accident that the psalm begins and ends, verse 1 and verse 9, with that repeated refrain. That's a poetic example here. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is a sense in which our entire lives are lived between those two verses. Verse 1 and verse 9. You put those up there. Psalm 8, verse 1 and verse 9. Your life and my life is lived between those verses. In fact, you could all of humanity, all of human history is lived between those verses. Creation begins in Genesis 1 with exclamation of praise. The angels rejoicing at the creation. In the beginning, God spoke it all into existence, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was very good. And do you know how the story ends? It ends also with praise and glory and majesty around the throne, the, the Lamb of God on the throne, and all of creation singing his praises again. The story begins and ends with praise. So does Psalm 8. And our lives are lived between those two things. I'm going to take a little risk here. Years ago when I was a high school pastor, I led a group of, of uh, young men that were meeting. We called it the Bulldog Bible Study. I, led a, I was a volunteer football coach at Batavia High School. And some of these guys that played football there were in uh, our church and some were not. That We met on my back deck for Bible study, uh, weekly meetings. And, and I was trying to teach them uh, about the things of God. And I read to them a poem by one of my favorite poets, Gerard Manley Hopkins. It was a mistake. These were, these were 16 to 18 year old high school boys. They did not get it. But I'm going to try it again with you because I think you probably may be able to get it. This poem is called God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men not now wreck his rod? Generations have trod have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness of deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, O oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. A professor of mine said, You don't get the magic of any poem till you read it five times out loud. I won't do that to you. I love that poem. Hopkins puts our, our, our toil and sin and suffering and questioning and doubt and wrestling in the context where it belongs, between the universe is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It's God's declaring things. We don't always see it. Sometimes we ignore it. C.S. Lewis wrote, a man can no more d d diminish God's glory in creation by denying it than a lunatic can blot out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the wall of his cell. It's there. And yet, it's smeared and bleared because we're messed up. But there's this ending part to it. It's not over. It retains something of its glory. And there's a sense in which our whole lives are lived in that place. Now, verse 2, you might, we'll go back for just a minute. You might have, you might, if, you're, if you're honest, if you're reading this, this psalm, it all kind of makes sense except for verse 2, doesn't it? Let me read it again. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And what if it jumped right to, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you've set in place, that makes sense, right? But I skipped over a part. Did you catch it? I skipped over this part. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. What? Did you, did you, did you, does it sound like it's out of place? When you read it, it sounds like, well, what's that doing in there? What's David saying? Is that like a, a mistake? Was that a, did it get in the wrong poem? What is he saying there? It doesn't seem to fit. It's actually very, very important for us. It's the contrast between the majesty and glory of God in creation and the weakness and vulnerability of a child. It's also, well, first of all, I mean, and I think you intuitively know this, 
There's nothing quite so powerful as hearing a child declare truth. Have you ever heard that? Grandson, granddaughter, son, daughter, when they're young, saying something, declaring something that's true about God's creation. Sort of, it sort of shuts up all the philosophers. <laughs> it stops you in your tracks, out of the mouths of babes. But it's also a very powerful messianic reference. I don't know if you knew that. God's ordained his strength to be manifest in the weakest, most vulnerable among us, a baby. Now, when it says to still the silence the foe and the avenger, it doesn't mean Marvel's avenger. Like, avenger's a, a, not a good thing. The Hebrew word there means the scoffer, the mocker, the one who sets himself up, seeks vengeance against the people and the things of God. God God's saying, we've got enemies. There, there are those who oppose me in the world. There are forces against the forces of God in the world. What's God's plan to deal with those forces and those voices? To shout powerfully from the sky, thunderbolts to strike them down? That's actually not the gospel. The gospel is God has ordained the weak things of the world to shame the, wi- the strong, the foolish things to shame the wise, Paul says. Nowhere is this more true than in the birth of Jesus. In fact, you know that the only part of Psalm 8 that Jesus quotes is this part, verse 2. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 16, this is the story of the triumphal entry and cleansing the temple. And Jesus cleansed the temple, and then as he's in the temple, crowds, including children, are singing his praises, shouting Hosanna. Let me read to you verses 16, or 14 through 16. And the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. What's Jesus saying there? This is God's plan. This is God's plan to silence those who would oppose him. Not what you'd expect. A declaration of praise from the weakest and most vulnerable. And then David goes on and he answers his own question about what man is in verses 5 through 8. He says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Now, some of your translations might say angels. The Hebrew word there for heavenly beings is the word Elohim. It's uh, also used for God. It's the plural version of that. So it means gods, Elohims, the gods. Now that's, some translators wrestle with this. What does that mean? There's a, a variety of opinions. The spiritual beings, created spiritual beings. G- God is saying, I've made you just lower, just slightly lower on earth than the greatest of my creation. In fact, on earth, you, we are the pinnacle of his creation. He says, you are crowned with glory and honor. Unique in all creation. Now, now to one degree... All of God's creation reflects his glory. We all, all of it does. That's what we sing in How Great Thou Art, right? When I see the, the brook and feel the gentle breeze, when I look, at mountain, look down from lofty mountain grandeur, in creation we see something of the image of God reflected. But I would say that's like looking into a pond. It's a reflection, but not a perfect reflection. We are like mirrors. Human beings are created to be the most clear, the most precise reflection of the glory of God in all creation. David really is echoing Genesis chapter 1 here in verses 5 through 8. Chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That sounds an awful lot like Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8, doesn't it? Given him dominion over the works of your hands, put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. David's echoing the, sto- the part of the story where we find out what scholars call the Imago Dei, the image of God. We're made in his image. Think of the words David uses. Crowned with glory and honor. Dominion, rule, honor, glory. These are words reserved for God. 
What is he saying? God, of all his creation, has bestowed on human beings, men and women, dominion, glory, honor, the crown of being made in his image, not like looking into a murky pond, but a mirror to reflect his glory in the world. That's the answer to the question he's asking. Now, the, the idea of the Imago Dei has huge, enormous implications for our lives. Let me give you just four briefly. First, psychological. Psychologically speaking, this means there is an irreducible value to every human life. This is a much greater foundation for the dignity of humanity than anything our secular culture can give us. C.S. Lewis, in an essay called The Weight of Glory, says, you have never met a mere mortal. There are no ordinary people. Nations, civilizations, these, he says, are mortal. And their life is to ours as that of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we work, live, love, snub, and exploit. The, one of the implications of what David is saying here is that it should impact how you see people. There are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. They're all made in his image. We're told in our culture you need a greater sense of self-worth or self-esteem. Where do you get it? Where does it come from? From telling yourself that you're valuable? Second implication, sociological. This view, David's view here in Psalm 8, 5 through 8, radically undermines any system of division, ethnical, ethical, ethnic, racial, economic. There can be none. Let me read to you uh, out of G.K. Chesterton's essay called The Conundrum. I think Chesterton is, uh, he's got two initials for first name, so, you know, like our friend C.S. He writes, as a politician, modern man will cry out that all war is a waste of life. As a philosopher, that all life is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant and then prove by the highest philosophical principles the peasant ought to have killed himself. The man of the school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treating them as if they were beasts. Then he takes his hat and umbrella, goes out to a scientific meeting where he proves they practically are beasts. You hear the conundrum? We want to talk about why life matters, but then we undermine it with our, our view of how, wh where life came from. This is what I, why I was saying earlier. You can't answer the question of the meaning of humanity apart from answering the question of the glory of God. So there's psychological, sociological implications. There's also ecological implications. And I, now, don't get tripped up with some political agenda here about, I'm not talking about climate change. I'm, I'm not talking about what we should or shouldn't do politically speaking. I'm saying as Christ followers in the world, we should be the most concerned with the preservation of this world. Because it's not going to burn up. It's going to be restored. We're, we're caretakers in it. He's given us dominion and responsibility in this world. The, so the Imago Dei means that we are placed in God's world for a particular purpose, to reflect his glory to other people and to care for the world, which also reflects his glory. And lastly and most importantly, we're spiritual, there are spiritual implications. We are mirrors, not lamps. A mirror has no light of its own. You cannot generate your own light and beauty and glory, though many, 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 many try. We can only reflect the light and beauty and the glory of the one that we are turned toward. That's what a mirror does, right? So we're made to turn our mirror to the right one, the one who made us in his image. You will never get a sense of your own worth and value by looking inside yourself. <laughs> I always, whenever I talk about that, I think of the old Saturday Night Live sketch, Stuart Smalley. Some of you will know, some of you will not know, but I'm going to quote it anyway. Where, where it's, it, the sketch is called Daily Affirmations with Stuart Smalley, where he looks into a mirror at his own reflection. He says, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. That's not going to work, friends, with apologies to Stuart Smalley. You'll never get a true sense of your worth and value by looking inside yourself or by trying to tell yourself. It must come from outside of you. But who's going to tell you? That's what Psalm 8 is saying. God will tell you. 
He's the only one who actually can. And last, a response of worship. God made you in his image. He placed you here to reflect his glory. When Paul in Romans 12, 1 says that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, this is our spiritual act of worship. Worship, we, we, ha- we often reduce, Pastor Kent and I talk about this frequently, to singing for a few hours or a few minutes on a Sunday morning or, you know, maybe once a week. That's not worship. That's a part of it. That's, that's, that's an expression of praise. Worship is the offering of your whole self back to the God who made you. Living according to your created design and purpose. That's worship. Living according to your created design and purpose. Elizabeth Elliot, in her book, These Strange Ashes, says that a clam glorifies God, worships God better than you do, because a clam is living according to its created design, and you are not always doing that. Fair enough. However, I would say a clam doesn't have a choice in the matter. A clam's just a clam. We do. So while we can reject and resist our created purpose, we also can intentionally glorify God and reflect his image in a way that no other part of creation can. We're unique in that way. One of the answers to the question, uh, who am I? We're the only ones asking the question. I don't think a clam is pondering its existence, right? I don't think that, that mosquitoes are wondering, who are we that we should sting and bite so frequently, right? They're not. We are the only ones asking that question, which means we have a unique opportunity to see the one who made us, come into relationship with him through Christ, and reflect his glory in the world. Our preaching and our praising on a Sunday morning is not all that our worship is. In fact, rightly understood, what we're doing here right now and have been doing since 915 is realigning our minds and our hearts with the one who made us so that we can go out and worship him more effectively. That's why we gather, to give him glory and praise, yes, but also we get, we get out of alignment. We need to realize, it's like, a, it's like a great spiritual chiropractic adjustment, right? We come in here to get put back in line because we go out into our lives then and we worship him by living according to our created design, by reflecting his glory, by treating every soul in the world. Uh, Thomas Traherne wrote a book called A Century of Meditations. It's this, it's a, he's, a, he's a 17th century metaphysical poet one of C.S. Lewis's favorites, or I would never have picked him up and read him. He's got these, li- these little meditations, and one of them is my favorite. He says, you never enjoy the world aright until you esteem every soul in it as great a treasure as our Savior doth. I just like to say the word doth. But I, I think about what he's saying. You don't live rightly in the world until you see every person in it the way our Savior does. Somebody made in the image of God of value and dignity and worth that he died for, that he desperately loves. They might be ignorant of that. They might be rejecting that. Nevertheless, he loves them as he loves you. So David asked the great question, right? What are we? And he answers it. You can only answer that question in light of answering the question of who God is, the one who made you, who loves you, who died died for you, and has placed you in his world. Let's pray together. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And you have crowned us with glory and honor and placed us right where we are. We are not accidents. We are certainly not you, God, But we're not accidents either. We're made by you and for you and placed here to reflect you. Forgive us for living for our own agendas according to our own desires. God, help us to see our lives as lived between these two exaltations of praise. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And only there do we find that our lives have meaning. We thank you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.